Thank you very much. Um, and and, and as, as was said, uh, Dr. Canero did um, go through very nicely and elegantly uh, making the case that they're not identical. And fortunately, I agree with her that they're not identical. Um, gastric cancer epidemiology and heterogeneity will go through that and highlight the fact that it's not a signal disease. And also, there's significant global heterogeneity. I think that's important as well with regard to drug development. Um, we are working towards a molecular classification, and she uh, mentioned already the molecular classification of intestinal and diffuse gastric cancer. And then um, we'll touch upon therapeutic implications, as, as um, you mentioned. I think that that's just at the beginning of our understanding, and we need to come to this more. So conceptually, any cancer you can think of as um, having different factors, genetic risks or genetic behavior, um, May, may affect uh, your risk, the environment, for example, in gastric cancer, H. pylori, or behavior, smoking or salt intake or something like that. Risk factors for gastric cancer, we heard about H. pylori, the CAG A strain. It gives you a risk of about 2.5. But there's also an important information about host or human genetic polymorphisms. So polymorphisms in IL-4, IL-1, will also increase your risk of gastric cancer. And the concept is that if your immune response to having a chronic H. pylori infection is significant or high, you may then um, uh, lead to a chronic inflammatory state, which then promotes the development of the disease. The point that I, maybe I should make is that about half of the world's population, so over 3 billion people have gastric cancer, I'm sorry, have H. pylori infection but gastric cancer may be attributed to, to H. pylori infection in maybe 500,000 cases. So the risk of gastric cancer if you have H. pylori infection is less than 1%, much less than 1%. So there are other triggers, other factors that we need to consider. Tobacco use confers a risk of about two, and family history has a significant risk of about 3.67, and we heard very nicely about the importance of hereditary diffuse gastric cancer and CDH1 mutations. Um, and this is a list of the most common hereditary syndromes associated with gastric cancer. Hereditary diffuse gastric cancer comprises the, um, about 3 to 5 percent, which is about a third of all genetic predisposition syndromes for gastric cancer. Lynch syndrome is associated with increased gastric cancer. Um, about 10 percent of Lynch families have gastric cancer. FAP confers a risk. If you have a mutation in APC, you're tenfold more likely to get gastric cancer as well. You should be aware of that. Lee-Farmani syndrome and Poitier-Eger syndrome as well. Uh, this was mentioned earlier. Uh, hereditary diffuse gastric cancer is caused by a germline mutation in CDH1. Um, this is the paper by David Huntsman in 2001 in the New England Journal that highlights the fact that the standard of care for these patients, at least patients who kindreds who have a germline mutation in CDH1 um, and no evidence of disease, the standard of care is to consider a prophylactic gastrectomy at least beginning in their 20s. Um, and this is the ecadherin pathway um, and a germline mutation in ecadherin or a somatic mutation in ecadherin, as was discussed earlier, um, leads to loss of protein at the cell surface. This is why diffuse gastric cancer grows in a uh, discohesive way, um, and that leads to increasing beta-catenin in the cytosol, and then nuclear translocation and uh, carcinogenesis. Um, so conceptually, from a genetic risk standpoint, we have CDH1, we have mismatch repair, APC, we have immune modulatory uh, SNPs that lie between genetic risk and environment. On environment, we have H. pylori and the CAG A strain we mentioned. And then behavior, fruits and vegetables, for example, reduce your risk. So we're filling this Venn diagram out. We talked about heterogeneity already, histology, intestinal diffuse and mixed types. Location is very different. Proximal tumors have a different epidemiology than antral tumors. Um, and etiology was mentioned already. Uh, this is a picture of intestinal gastric cancer. Um, and here is diffuse gastric cancer with uh, no uh, formations of uh, crypts or, or circular structures. These are cells that are growing as in a discohesive way through the stomach wall. Uh, 
And then here's some epidemiologic data that suggests the importance of GE junction or distal esophageal proximal uh, stomach cancers. Um, they're rising in incidence, both in the U.S. and in Europe, um, whereas uh, both GE junction and cardiac tumors are, whereas the true distal gastric cancer, the one caused by chronic inflammation, is decreasing. That was mentioned earlier as well. Risk factors across esophagus and GE junction tumors. So you have diet, alcohol, hot drinks for esophageal cancer, acid reflux, obesity, smoking for GE junction tumors, H. pylori, atrophic gastritis for distal gastric cancer. So we can't really group these tumors similarly. They're really different. They have different epidemiology, different risk factors. Um, and this is mentioned earlier. The incidence of stomach cancer is decreasing throughout the world. These, these are data from Japan, the UK, and the US, whereas esophageal cancer is actually rising in much of the world. And I mentioned here proximal versus distal gastric cancer and the different epidemiology. Um, the GE junction cardiac tumors, uh, much more prevalent in males and females. Uh, in the U.S., more prevalent in white people than black people, wide age range, and then more common in industrialized nations. For non-cardiac tumor, um, it is uh, still a male predominant, but not as high, and the, incre the incidence increases with age. So based on this, we um, constructed a uh, hypothesis that perhaps we could divide gastric cancer into three subtypes. A non-cardiac gastric cancer, which is the distal um, type caused by chronic inflammation. So high dietary salt, H. pylori, um, tobacco, these are things that increase the risk. Um, the use of NSAIDs, uh, the eating fruits and vegetables may decrease risk. And then you have immune regulatory SNPs that would alter risk. For proximal gastric cancers, obesity, high BMI, um, alcohol, tobacco use increase your risk. Um, we don't, we haven't yet identified a specific genetic um, indication. And then in the middle, diffuse gastric cancer, which could be either proximal or diffuse or, or distal. Um, so it's independent of location, but it's a very different biology, di very different histology. And as was mentioned earlier, um, CDH1 is probably the most important genetic defect. So if there are three different subtypes, at least clinically, based on location and on risk factors and histology, um, they, they should have three different genomic signatures as well. And so we looked at that very carefully um, in a preliminary study of 57 patients with locally advanced gastric cancer. This was part of a phase two study of preoperative chemotherapy. We did pretreatment by endoscopic biopsies, and we examined their expression analysis. So we were able to get 36 patients with adequate RNA, and we compared to normal tissue. And thankfully, cancer and normal are very different in an unsupervised cluster analysis. So that's encouraging that um, that was an internal control that we were able to confirm. Um, classically, we think of gastric cancer, and we describe it as Lorenz histology and also location. But if we think of proximal tumors that are non-diffuse, um, diffuse tumors, which are type 2, we think, and then distal tumors that are non-diffuse as different subtypes, this is how they would play out. And then looking at the comparison of the expression analysis of each subtype versus normal, we see a very nice Venn diagram. We see um, some overlap between gastric cancer and normal, but many, many more genes that are either up or down regulated uh, when compared to normal are unique between type 1, type 2, and type 3. And uh, this is using a false discovery rate of 5% and a full change of at least 2. And using this, we were able to come up with a signature that had an 85% prediction for uh, determining the subtype. So this suggests, it suggests strongly that at a molecular level, there are subtypes of gastric cancer that differ, not only epidemiologically, not only by risk factors, but also on a molecular level and an expression analysis, um, subtypes do differ. And then as was mentioned by Dr. Conero, um, Professor Tan uh, did a examination of 37 gastric cancer cell lines and also four independent patient cohorts from which he was able to identify tissue. And he looked at a 171 gene set that robustly classified tumors as either 
intestinal or diffuse at the molecular level, not based on histology, but based on a molecular classification. And you can see here the molecular or the, the, the genetic um, distinction of intestinal or diffuse, uh, in blue or red, um, they look very different on a cluster diagram, and there are genes that are either up or down regulated in each subtype. And then this is a very nice graph that demonstrates that the, the dark blue and the dark red is the genetic signature for intestinal or diffuse, and the uh, smaller lines here is the Lorenz classification by pathology. So you can see that within the genetic classification of intestinal gastric cancer, you have an enrichment for Lorenz intestinal. And within the genetic classification of um, diffuse gastric cancer, you have an enrichment for Lorenz diffuse subtype. And um, it's flawed because the mixed subtype isn't delineated here. It's either intestinal or diffuse, but it's an enrichment. So about two-thirds of um, intestinal gastric cancer by histology would, would genetically code for uh, genetic dif intestinal gastric cancer, and two-thirds of diffuse gastric cancer by histology would code for um, diffuse gastric cancer genetically as well. So um, it, it, it's an enrichment um, that is suggestive of intestinal or diffuse, but the important point is that it suggests that there are subtypes of gastric cancer that differ on a molecular level. So the implications of these genomic analyses is that gastric cancer is not one disease. Subtypes of gastric cancer exist. And the observed differences in response to therapy and prognosis may be explained based on these different subtypes. Because the subtypes will have different molecular drivers and um, therefore different molecular targets. So we talked about disease heterogeneity based on um, uh, histology and location and biology and even expression analysis. Um, but there's also significant global heterogeneity. Um, the disease is much more prevalent in Asia. There's H. pylori variants worldwide. For example, H. pylori is very prevalent in Africa, yet gastric cancer is not so prevalent in Africa. Um, there's more advanced disease in the US and in Europe. And there's a question of whether or not there's different underlying biology. So adding to the conceptual model, on top of genetic risk, environment, and behavior, we have subtypes. Subtypes, proximal, non-diffuse gastric cancer, distal, non-diffuse gastric cancer, and diffuse gastric cancer are overlaid because they're not the same. The risk factors are different. The environment that causes, uh, the environmental risk that causes disease is not the same, and the behaviors that causes the disease is not the same. This was mentioned earlier about tumor heterogeneity. So this is a very nice study looking at the somatic copy number alterations in, across different diseases. And you can see that gastric cancer is on the right here, um, right, right there. So it's a, a disease that has high genetic variation. Here's the global heterogeneity of gastric cancer. So as I mentioned earlier, more prevalent in Asia more than half of the world's population, I mean, more than half the world's population of gastric cancer comes from Asia. In um, the, the US, we have much, much less. In, uh, and then in Africa, it's also very low. So does this global vari variation matter? Um, Vivian Strong at our institution, working with a, with a uh, hospital from Korea, examined um, two large databases of gastric cancer resections, one from the United States, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and one from Korea. Um, and the, the study population was uh, about 700 patients from the US and 1,600 patients from Korea. That These are patients that did not receive preoperative chemotherapy, patients that had a complete resection, and a final margin that was R0. And the first thing to highlight is that the location was very different. So proximal type 1 gastric cancer is 40% in the US population, whereas it's about 9% in the Asian population. Um, Asian population has much more prevalent lower body um, uh, disease. So subtypes are different across the globe. So when one says that 
uh, patients from Asia live longer, it may not be that we're talking about the same disease. It may be that the population of patients that Asians have, which is more prevalent middle and lower gastric cancer, is different than the population that is in the West. Um, in Korea, the majority of patients were diagnosed with early stage disease, uh, stage 1A or 1B, uh, and that's not so in the US. And then surgery, well, this was mentioned earlier as well. The 30-day post-operative mortality was 2% in, uh, in, in the US. And this is not the US globally, this is uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, which has, which has over 100 gastrectomies a year. So we heard earlier from Dr. Vandevelt the importance of the uh, hospital volume, but this is a high, high um, volume center in the United States, still with a 30-day post-op mortality of 2%. So even when considering all these different risk factors, um, the disease-specific survival was quite different in Korea versus the US. Um, the disease-specific survival was 80% in Korea, about 10% higher than the US. And um, if this projects well, you can see that for every, every stage, uh, the risk of death was better um, in Korea versus in the US. So after considering all the different risk factors, the um, patients that uh, were resected in Korea had about a 30% improvement in survival stage for stage compared to patients in the US. And so they can't exclude an inherent biologic difference between gastric cancer in the United States and Korea. So adding to our diagram and the complexity of gastric cancer, we have global heterogeneity as well. The disease might be different across the globe. So this has significant implications in drug development. So gastric cancer is not one disease. We've had a couple lectures now that highlight that point. That's supported by epidemiology, risk factors, molecular analysis, and even global variation. The implications for drug development. So it's very important, and you've heard this many times before, that we need to understand our target. We have to understand that a CMET inhibitor is probably more likely to be beneficial in patients who are CMET overexpressed. The question that came up earlier is that is CMET overexpression more prevalent in type 1 gastric cancer, proximal, non diffuse, or is it more prevalent in diffuse gastric cancer? These are things that we don't know yet, but we'll need to find out. You have to understand the disease. What type of disease are you focused on? Um, and is your population adequately enriched for that disease? Uh, because the disease is not the same across the globe. That's my last slide. So with that, I'll take questions.